Each week, Mr. Jones asks me, is this the sermon title that we are to print? And those of us who are in worship planning know that's exactly what he asks. And I look at it and I say, yes. And this week I changed it. I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, sometimes that happens. Um, it's a funny thing how when you actually read deep into the text, a new meaning emerges between Tuesday and Sunday. So um, this sermon title is Women of Valor. Women of Valor. I invite you to join with me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. The Monday after Mother's Day in 2014, the late Rachel Held Evans, author of A Year of Biblical Womanhood, sat down and wrote this in her blog. It never fails. Every year on this day, I receive a flood of messages from women who spent yesterday morning grimacing through yet another Proverbs 31 sermon. The pastors usually mean well. They want to honor women on Mother's Day, so they turn to the biblical passage most associated with femininity, the one that culminates with what may be the most cross-stitched Bible verse of all time. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. But for women like me, who grew up thinking of the domestic superheroine of Proverbs 31 as just another impossible standard by which to mark my shortcomings as a woman, the passage can come with, let's say, some baggage. That's because too often we focus on the Proverbs 31 woman's role as a way of reducing marriage to motherhood and to women, womanhood, to marriage, motherhood, and domesticity, when really this passage is about character that transcends both gender and circumstance. Ms. Held Evans went on to explain that po Proverbs 31 is much more complex than most people acknowledge. Most of us find ourselves grimacing, and I'm sure some of you felt a little grimace this morning, <laughs> when the simplistic, especially you, Emily, you had to read it, so, especially when the simplistic, perfect image of the good wife is laid out. But we should know more about this passage before we toss it onto our pile that's entitled Passages from the Bible, which we are gonna run away from or simply ignore, that pile. First, Proverbs 31 is a poem the subject of a 22-line poem found in the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, which has been talking about wisdom and foolishness for the first 30, passage, first 30 chapters. The woman of noble character is meant to be a tangible expression of the book's celebrated virtue of wisdom. The male author is essentially showing us what wisdom looks like in action. The astute reader will immediately make the connection between this 31st chapter and the women of wisdom in the other chapters. Packed with, hy with hyperbole, militaristic imagery, the poem is an acrostic, okay? So it is the first word of each verse begins with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet in succession. So it doesn't even necessarily make sense in some ways as you're reading it. It's like, uh, you know, like a children's way of teaching the ABCs. It's a way of taking you through the alphabet. This communicates a sense of totality as the poet praises the everyday achievements of an upper class Jewish wife, a woman who keeps her household functioning day and night by buying, trading, listen to what she's doing, investing, planting, sewing, spindling, managing servants, extending charity, providing food for the family, and preparing for each season. It's no wonder women don't need men. Look at all she's doing. Like any good poem, the purpose of this one is to draw attention to the often overlooked glory of the everyday experience. Rachel writes, as a poem, Proverbs 31 should not be interpreted prescriptively 
as a job description for all women. Its purpose is to celebrate wisdom in action, not to instruct women everywhere to get married, to have children, and to take up the loom. I like that line. Second, the target audience of Proverbs 31 is men. In a year of biblical womanhood, Rachel explains something she learned from her Jewish friend Ahava. In Ahava's culture, it's not the women who memorize Proverbs 31, it's the men. I have never heard ever in my ministry all these years of a men's gathering focusing on Proverbs 31, but who knows, it's 2021, maybe something will happen right this year. Ahava says, in fact, they memorize it. They sing it as a song of praise to the women in their lives, their wives, their daughters, their sisters, their mothers, their friends. Ahava's husband sings Proverbs 31 to her at every Shabbat meal. Now I know Jewish friends who do the same thing. In fact, I've been at Shabbat dinners with them when the men have done this for their wives, holding their hands, singing to them of their amazing abilities and the amazing things they do for their lives. This poem, again, it's not prescriptive. It is not even instructive, except for men. Praise her for all her hands have done, it says to the men. And yet many Christians interpret this passage prescriptively as a command to women rather than an ode to women. With the home-based endeavors of Proverbs 31, the woman is cast as the ideal lifestyle of, all, uh, lifestyle of all women of faith. That's not what this is about. It's about simply joy, an empire of books and conferences and products and media has evolved from the subtle repositioning of the poem's intended audience, from that of men to that of women. In evangelical Christianity, there is actually a book entitled Becoming the Woman God Wants Me to Be, a 90-day guide to living Proverbs 31 for life. Yikes. This was written to encourage women to stay at home and dedicate themselves to working for the man. Hmm, sounds kind of oppressive. Um, this proverb has become oppressive because men, primarily, and women, have turned it from a song through which a man offers a woman praise to the task list through which a woman earns praise. Once again, I say don't blame the text for the way we, particularly we men, have abused the text and thus pile on abuse for women and teens and little girls. Finally, and most importantly of all, Proverbs 31 celebrates valor. The best translation of the first line of Proverbs 31 is not a virtuous woman who can find, rather it is best translated a woman of valor who can find. The, pre, the Hebrew is, uh, Eshet Shayil, Eshet Shayil, woman of valor, the male equivalent of Gibor Shalil, a man of valor. In Judaism, women cheer one another when this is offered as a blessing in this poem. They celebrate everything from promotions to pregnancies to childbirth to acts of mercy, to acts of justice, to battles with cancer, with a hearty, a shet shayil, a shet shayil. You go, girl, is what it really translates to in the vernacular when women are saying that to each other. Each of us needs to celebrate women of valor when fighting the battles of life, when overcoming cancer, a shet shayil, a woman of valor. When you get up each morning, and you create and care and lead and pray and drive children around who are driving you crazy all around, you are Ishet Shayil, a woman of valor. Men, say it to the women in your life. I'm gonna say it to my mother and my wife today. Women, say it to yourself and other women in your life. Ishet Shayil, Ishet Shayil. Valor isn't about what you do, it's about how you do it. 
If you are a stay-at-home mom, be a stay-at-home woman of valor. If you're a working mom, be a working woman of valor. If you're a nurse, be a nurse of valor. If you're a CEO or a receptionist, be a CEO and a receptionist of valor. If you're rich or poor, single, divorced, widowed or married, do it with valor. That's what makes someone a Proverbs 31 woman, not creating a life worthy of Pinterest boards. Proverbs 31 should not be tossed out. It should be interpreted correctly and it should be interpreted by women. I thank Rachel for this. It should be interpreted as a song sung, a song of praise to women, not turned into a horribly burdensome task list of to-dos and marks of greatness in the eyes of those who want to just hold you in a box. It should celebrate faithfulness instead of judge and afflict women. It should be a door rather than a wall. When you open the door, you will see many women of valor there in scripture and in our lives. Proverbs 31 is not the first or the last time the Bible presents Ishet Shayil, a woman of valor. Read the book of Ruth. Ruth was a destitute foreigner whose daily work involved gathering, threshing, and winnowing wheat. For most of her life story, she was neither a wife nor a mother. Circumstantially, her life looked nothing like a life of the woman depicted in Proverbs 31. Ruth didn't spend her days making clothes for her husband. She didn't have a husband. She was widowed. Ruth's children didn't rise up and call her blessed because she was childless. Ruth didn't spend her days exchanging fine linens with the merchants and keeping an immaculate home. She didn't have one. She worked all day in the sun, gleaning leftovers from other people's fields, which was a provision made for the poorest of the poor in Israel. And yet, guess what Boaz says of Ruth before she gets married, before she has a child, before she becomes a wealthy and influential woman. He says, all the people of my town know that you are a woman of valor a woman of noble character, Ishet Shayil. Ruth is, is identified as a woman of valor not because she checked off all the Proverbs 31 to-do list by getting married, keeping a clean house, producing children, but because she lived her life with incredible bravery, with wisdom, with strength, and most important of all, a characteristic that appears throughout scripture with women of valor, with integrity. And how about the multitudes of Yvette Shayil, women of valor throughout the scripture, Sarah and Deborah and Esther and Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany and Martha and Mary of Nazareth, Priscilla, Phoebe, Tabitha, to name just a few, all women of valor. This sum summer, I was blessed on my sabbatical to have conversations with 20 women of valor across the nation, across Jewish and Christian faith. Their unique gifts, their insights, their passions, their callings have brought hope and healing to the world and their integrity is what guides them every day. Fortunately for you, I'm not gonna take you through the 30 hours of conversations I had with these 20 women. I mean, literally fortunately for you. I will share one of a conversation I had twice, actually. The only person I talked to twice. Ruth Messinger, who lives in New York City with a four-generation family in her New York apartment, as she says, don't worry, it's big. That's four generations, though. She has been a political leader in New York City, the borough president of Manhattan, and in 1997, the Democratic nominee against incumbent Rudy Giuliani. Ah. Oh if it only had turned out differently. Anyway, but beyond politics, Ruth was president and CEO of American Jewish World Service for 18 years. She has been named as one of the 20 most influential American Jews. Not women Jews, Jews, period. Currently, Ruth serves as the inaugural social justice fellow at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America where she where she trains, as she calls them, the young guys <laughs> to become rabbis. And she is the social justice activist in residence 
a job I really think is cool, at the Jewish Community Center in Manhattan. The reason I had two conversations with Ruth was because during the entire first conversation, all she could talk about was her mother, Marjorie Weiler, who's a true woman of valor. You see how it works? One woman of valor raises another woman of valor. In an hour of Zoom, I never heard Ruth say anything about Ruth the whole time. The second hour wasn't much different because I found out Ruth doesn't like talking about Ruth. <laughs> but Ruth did share many blessings, many stories with me. When I asked about the inspiration of her life, she quoted Abraham Joshua Heschel. In a free society where wrongs are done, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Wow. She explained that we all have an obligation to do justice, to do the right thing in this world, to right the wrongs. She gets, to, gets pushback from the kids on campus, as she calls them. Again, the young rabbis in training. And she's 81, so she's allowed to say that. Um, she teaches them the word obligation. They don't like it. They see it as oppressive to be obligated to something. She responds, then the prophets were oppressive and speaks directly to them. And then she said to me, and if obligation is a problem, Jesus was oppressive too, because <laughs> he had plenty of obligations for all of you to follow. She continues, obligation is a good thing. It means that I feel the urgent need to engage you and respond to you and interact with you. Our society is so fragile in so many ways for so many people. We need to be obliged to feel their pain, to respond to their needs, to meet this world and make it a better place. No obligation is oppressive, it is liberating. She concludes about obligation, the obligation of doing justice. Scripture is very clear, justice is never about completing the task. Justice knows that once an outcome is reached, that outcome will immediately be challenged. So we are told, justice you must pursue. And the pursuit of justice, she says, is the calling of every single person of faith a woman of valor. You see, women of valor are everywhere in our lives. They're in this room right now. I pray this day that Proverbs 31 doesn't get tossed under your pile of passages that you don't like and would rather not deal with because there's more to this powerful poem than a misogynistic interpretation ever could give us. The challenge of reading the text is always about digging deep enough to see the gift that was intended from the beginning, especially with this text. And each and every one of us, we know, has been blessed with a Shet Cheville, women of valor in our lives. So let us embrace this truth for our lives and give thanks for all of those women who have liberated this text, and because of that, each of us. Amen.